Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> I was worried something like this would happen. All right, <laughs> here we go. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for Economic Freedom, Economic Systems, and Lived Experience. Um, we have a panel of people here with us today that are going to discuss the uh, big picture, but also the day-to-day -day experience of living in a socialist or communist country. Um, and so we're really excited that you all um, were able to come and experience that uh, their testimony with us tonight. Um, I also just uh, want to say thank you to our special guests, uh, the, the Warner Robertson family tonight. Um, and then I want to take a minute to, do, to introduce the panelists. So we have Ms. Deanna Novoselska from GWR Wealth Management. Deanna is, uh, you are Director of Investments. Um, Chief Investment Officer at DWR Wealth Management. And we have Dr. Robert Lawson from SMU Cox School of Business. Um, Dr. Lawson will start us off here tonight. He's the um, founding um, author of the Economic Freedom of the World Index um, that's um, published by the um, Fraser Institute. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lawson is Jerome Fullenwinder, Centennial Chair in Economic Freedom, and he's also the director of the Bridewell Institute for Economic Freedom at the Southern Methodist University. Um, Bob has authored over 100 journal articles, uh, book chapters, policy reports, and also book reviews, and he's co-author with uh, Dr. Ben Powell of the book Socialism Sucks. Two economists drink their way through the unfree world. <laughs> so if you like what you hear from him tonight, then you should go and buy his book. And we also have with us um, Mr. Oleg Volk. Um, Oleg is originally from Russia, but now lives in Tennessee. And Oleg is a photographer and also a creative director. And then we have Rafael Acevedo, last but not least, who is um, program coordinator for the Institute for Economic Inquiry. Dr. Acevedo also teaches economics here at Creighton, so you might have seen him in the classroom. Um, before we get to our panel, I want to turn it over to our Dean, Dr. Tony Hendrickson, just to give a quick welcome. Thank you, Diana. Uh, welcome. Welcome to the Hyder College of Business and to Creighton University. We're pleased that you're here to join us. I think this will be an excellent investment of your time. Um, you know, our economic our, our Institute for Economic Inquiry was founded in 2014 and with a vision to impact the, the conversation and the discussion about free market capitalism and uh, to really highlight the uh, pros and, and to discuss some of the cons of what happens when we have free markets and free enterprise. And so we appreciate uh, the fact that that's been founded, and I want to acknowledge some of our initial investors, uh, Gail and uh, Scott Robertson, who uh, were part of the uh, Werner family that were the first investors in that. Uh, Gail's father, C.L. Werner, and, and uh, Rachel Werner were part of the initial investors in uh, the Institute for Economic Inquiry and helped to bring other donors into the fold that have helped to support this effort. I also want to mention that uh, C.L. Werner, and if you're not familiar, the founder uh, and champion of Werner Truck Lines, is a 2012 winner of the Horatio Alger Award. Uh, I think that you should take time to, to find out who those people are that they're Horatio Alger Award winners. Uh, they have incredible stories. The key factor is they are, these are people who are recognized for being self-made. Uh, traditional rags to riches story, if you will. People who, against all obstacles, without having any kind of jump start, 
and advantage in society were able to build themselves up and build great organizations and great enterprises because of free market capitalism, because of the, the, the financial structure that we have that allows people to invest in themselves, to work really hard, to persevere, and uh, to, to work with integrity and to build something uh, that our frame of, of economic system allows you to prosper and then share back with others so that they can do likewise. So I encourage you to understand that. Uh, we're excited about this being the first event in the uh, Menard Family Institute for Economic Inquiry. It's a newly named uh, uh, for our, econ our Institute for Economic Inquiry with uh, John Menard and his family. They've been investing in educational programs for many years, trying to provide opportunities for students to enhance your college experiences and to prepare for future success. Future success. And so it's really focused on giving you more opportunities by hearing about people, other people, and what they've been able to do, and for you to be able to reflect and do likewise. So uh, I'm excited about that. This is the first uh, event we have under the Menards uh, moniker, and we're excited about more in the future. So I thank our panelists for coming with us. And now I'll turn it back over to Dion. Thank you. So this is just oh, it's working okay, perfect. <laughs> um, I was gonna say yeah. this is just me doing something wrong. Um, we're gonna have Dr. Lawson start us off tonight with just some information more generally about the economic freedom of the world index. Um, so I'm just gonna turn it over to him. Okay, thank you, Diana and. Dean and everybody, thanks for coming. Uh, so socialism and capitalism are really big words. Um, and in our everyday language, we tend to use them as binaries. Uh, you know, Cuba, socialist. America, capitalist. We treat, uh, we treat the world as if it was a zero one. And the reality is it's not. Uh, my, my hero, Adam Smith, very famously said once, wrote once, there's a lot of ruin in every nation. And uh, I, might, I might adjust that a little bit. There's a lot of socialism in every nation, and there's a lot of capitalism in every nation. Uh, I think everyone here would probably agree that more or less the United States is a capitalist country, but we have some socialism in this country. We have our K through 12 educational system is more or less socialist. It's the state owning the means and uh, controlling the means of production when it comes to educating our children. Uh, in Canada, our friends to the north, they have uh, socialized uh, medical care. And to a certain extent, so do we, but let's not argue that right now. So we have socialism in the United States, but you know, the bulk of economic activity, the bulk of things that get done, the trucking, the agriculture, the housing, construction and things, most of that is done by private enterprise, private owners, profit motive and all that good stuff. So all the capitalist stuff. So we have socialism elements of it, but we're more or less capitalist. It's also true uh, that the nations that we call socialist nations, the, the Cubas, and, and even perhaps the North Koreas, uh, the old Soviet Union, these, these countries uh, are socialist countries. That's because most of the things are done through socialist means. The state is controlling the means of production. But even in the old Soviet Union, they had markets. Uh, and even in Mao's China, there were markets. There were limited realms where you could uh, exercise private enterprise. In today's catch, in today's Cuba, uh, there are private restaurants and private uh, housing uh, that you can rent, like, like little uh, Airbnb type operations and things like that. So there's a little bit of private enterprise, but it, that little bit of private enterprise exists in the context of a mostly socialist system. So I think one thing about when we say socialism and capitalism and these big words, we should try to get out of the zero one thinking, and that's where I should plug my, my life's work, which is this Economic Freedom of the World Index. This is what it looks like. I'm an Ohioan, so I would call this as a West Virginia PowerPoint. Um, I, don't, I don't know what state Nebraskans make fun of. Uh, but Iowa. Iowa. So this is an Iowa PowerPoint. Uh, forgive the Iowans, but that's how it is. And uh, this is a, a book that I've spent 30 years working on. This is our 25th edition. And it's the most boring book ever written. Uh, because most of it looks like this. And hopefully you can see how awful that is. 
Uh, that is Norway. The top marginal tax rate in Norway is 38%. The tariff rate in Norway is 6%. Uh, and I have 165 pages, looks like this. And all of you are already bored out of your heads, like, oh my gosh, when's this economist gonna stop talking? Um, but the reality is this, this project uh, creates an economic freedom index. And uh, at the very top, if I can find the right pitch page, this is totally an Iowa PowerPoint now. Um, so there's a page that looks like this. And at the top is Hong Kong. That's the most economically free, the most capitalist country that we have scored. It's a nine out of 10 on our scale. And at the bottom down here with a mighty 2.83 is Venezuela. We don't rate Cuba or North Korea, by the way. So Venezuela is last. So I have a I have an index score from 2.83 up to nine uh, of of how free market or not free market you are, and it's a continuum. You'll see all these countries in the middle. It's like a it's like a smooth continuum from socialism to capitalism. And the research that's been done on this index, uh, and uh, I won't bore you with too much, but there's some really cool charts in here. Get the paper flying around, that's my bookmarks. But look, uh, countries that are at the top have average incomes of $50,619, precisely. That was a joke, because we don't know how precise that is. <laughs> but then the least free countries, the bottom uh, quarter of the countries have an income level that's about one ninth as, as much, $5,900. And I got a whole bunch of charts, pages and pages of charts. Infant mortality, guess what? Countries that are more capitalist have less infant mortality than the ones that are most socialist. Uh, every single metric you can find, the capitalist countries do better than the socialist countries. Or the more, let's not do binaries, the more capitalist countries do better than the more socialist countries. And I've got academic articles. A few years ago, my friend Josh Hall, he's the he's co-author on this index, and he's now the dean at the Business School at West Virginia University. We, we decided, in a weak moment, we decided to read 400 journal articles, which was the worst summer of my life. And we scored, which, and they all used this index. And of the 400 articles, two thirds of them found that the index correlated with a good outcome. Like a good outcome, like faster growth, higher incomes, less infant mortality, cleaner environments. You name the good outcome, the more capitalist countries outperform the more socialist countries. Uh, Two thirds of the time, and the other one third of the time, the study was just, nah, didn't find anything. There was essentially zero studies out of 400 that found capitalism didn't perform well. And guess how many people read these studies? Well, Josh and I did. God, it was, it was terrible. No one read these studies. No one reads this stuff. I, I, I don't know if my life works this big. No one reads this. Um, well, some people do, but it's just a bunch of academics. No, one, no real people do. So, um, so this is where I think this panel is going to be so valuable. Uh, uh, you know, realizing that I had spent 25 years, 30 years of my life working on this economic freedom index, which had influenced academics. I'm very proud of our influence among, among academics. But it hadn't really changed the world. Uh, ben and I decided to write this book, that where Ben Powell is a professor at Texas Tech University, and we decided to write this book where we traveled to socialist countries, former socialist countries like like Russia, Ukraine, uh, Georgia, uh, Korea, China, Cuba, Venezuela, we went to all these countries and we wrote a book about our, our travels and our experiences as two, two economists. And guess what? People read that book, <laughs> and, and the subtitle of that book is Two Economists Drink Their Way Through Their Own Free World. It's like a very Anthony Bourdain style drunken travel log, uh, the least serious thing I'd ever done in my life, and yet people read that book. And, and the moral of the story is that although the facts and figures and the tariff rates and the, and the top marginal tax rates and all of that stuff really matters, if we're going to talk about capitalism and socialism to real people, people like you all in this audience, we need to personalize it with the, the lived experiences of people who have been there, like Ben and I went there, but more importantly, even the people on this panel who who literally lived in those experiences. So with that, I'm gonna shut up because I really wanna hear what everyone else has to say. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you, Bob, for starting us off. So, you know, as Dr. Lawson mentioned already, there's a lot of high-level evidence that um, capitalism performs much better in terms of making people better off, in terms of health outcomes, and even the environment, right? He mentioned 
um, than socialism. But we have this panel here um, to kind of illustrate a little bit what the lived experience and, and the day-to-day -day life, uh, lives of people is that live in those countries. Um, now, everybody on this panel, except Bob, is a migrant. I uh, immigrated from Germany, and even though Germany is not an unfree country, I came here because as an academic, I wouldn't have been able to do the kinds of things that I can do here in Germany because the labor market for academia there is just much more rigid. So in that sense, Germany is kind of an example of a country that, while not unfree generally, is a little bit less free than, than the United States are. Um, and that's true for everybody here. So I want to just ask our panelists to kind of give us a brief introduction to themselves. Uh, where are you guys from? Um, how long have you been here? When did you migrate? How old were you? And um, where did you come from? What was your experience there, roughly? Um, yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I, I, I come from Venezuela. I think that my, my, my history is, is very similar to millions of immigrants here in the United States that ran from away from, from the devastation of the very end stage of the socialism, okay? Um, I'm practically new here in the United States. I, in, a, in a few days, will be my fourth anniversary of my new life. And I say that my new life because really uh, is now when I am understanding how it's more capitalism and real capitalism. Because in Venezuela, sometimes you think that you, you, you have a capitalism before Chavez, uh, but that was not true. Then, uh, four years here, uh, 14, March 14th, exactly 2018, that I, that I left Venezuela. I left behind friends, my parents that passed away while I, I was here. Right? I mean, here, I couldn't go to, to, my, to the burial of my, of my mom and my dad because I couldn't return back to Venezuela. Um, my house, my job, I was professor there. I was a professor in a university, tenure professor. Uh, I, you know, I was I raised in, 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 in a country, as, uh, as Dr. Lawson said, it was not 100% socialist. But I, I knew all these paths from a kind of light socialism before Chavez and hard socialism after Chavez that destroyed all the future of, of a, a generation. Okay, then that is sometimes it's very sad. It's, it's very sad for me to, to hear young, young people, even young Americans, uh, that think that socialism is, is, is nice, is, is, is a happy word. Um, the reality is completely different. You will see the, that your returns, that your returns are diminishing uh, in comparison with, the, with, with your effort that you daily are increasing your, your effort. And it's very, it's, it's very difficult. That's my, my brief history. I don't, I don't like to take more time <laughs> to, to the panel because um, now I'm here enjoying the, the, the freedom of, of this country. Uh, let's see if this works. <laughs> does this work? Yes. It does, amazing. Uh, my name is Oleg Volk. I got out of USSR in late 1989, right before they started falling apart. So between personal experience and a little bit of research afterwards, I had a fairly clear idea of what I left behind, and I was extremely enthusiastic about it. Um, the time in the United States has been wonderful, and I can say with a degree of certainty that had I stayed there, I'm pretty sure I would not have been alive at this point, and I definitely would not have been sane. As it is, I can do what I want. I can be a creative director, I can be a photographer, I can be a writer, I can be a gun designer, all at the same time, all on my own. Uh, people look at socialism and often confuse it with a fat welfare state that is feeding off capitalism. Reality is socialism is essentially a monopoly, and it's a monopoly on employment. There's only one state employer. There's a monopoly on culture. Which means, for example, that if you are, let's say, a poet or a writer uh, in USSR and you do not go through official channels writing approved things, you get criminally charged with uh, uh, felony idleness. That was an offense that would put you in prison because you were not working for the state or saying things that the state approved of. 
and everything was like that. Uh, and after a while, after a couple of generations, you don't even know what you're missing. You're essentially growing up uh, without the use of most of your facilities or your capabilities, and uh, you don't know what you're missing. And the United States has been very good at uh, salvaging uh, rejects from communist and socialist countries. You know, American uh, uh, helicopter industry was started by a refugee from Russia. Uh, American heavy bomber industry was started by a refugee from Russia. Um, American uh, uh, nuclear industry was started by refugees from Germany and Italy. Uh, and so we win by being less socialist than others, but also some of you are old enough to remember price and wage controls of the 70s. We got pretty close to at least, if not socialism directly, but state-run uh, fascism, which is designed, uh, defined as uh, you put in the labor and the capital and the state directs you how to do business uh, and reaps the benefits. We don't want to go there, and the best way not to go there is to understand very clearly what we're risking. Good afternoon, my name is Diana Dulcelska. Um, as the other Diana on the panel mentioned, I'm the Chief Investment Officer of GWR Wealth Management here in Omaha. Um, I moved to the United States in uh, 2001 to pursue my education, and I have uh, two master's degrees from Creighton, so I'm a fellow alumni as well. Um, I believe that all of us are here because of the love we have for the United States. And I feel like I have to share with you some of the stories that were shared with me by my parents and grandparents and just to tell you that it's not what may be portrayed sometimes in the media and everywhere else and that communism slash socialism is not, is not a good thing, to say the least. Um, I'm very thankful for the opportunities that this country has given me. And uh, I was only six, almost seven years old when communism fell in Bulgaria. But some of the stories that my family had shared with me and just living through the post-communist uh, era, uh, which I believe haunts Bulgaria to this day, uh, are just incredible. So I just cannot wait to share some of them with you. Yeah, um, so Diana, you, you mentioned that your family um, experienced persecution and also expropriation. Your family's land was taken away. Um, and do you want to just share a little bit more with us about that? So under communism in Bulgaria, uh, how did your family fare compared to before? Absolutely. So our family story is no different than that of a lot of people. Um, what my family had though is that before communism came in Bulgaria in 1944, my family was quite wealthy. And it was not wealthy by, for any other reason, but because I had a very, um, I, I had a grandfather who came from very poor means, a little bit kind of like the story of Gail and Scott here. But through perseverance, he became one of the best engineers in Eastern Europe. So he studied in uh, Prague and in Germany, in Berlin, um, in the beginning of the 20th century. So he had my father when he was 56 years old, and that was his only child. So my grandfather was actually born in 1894. And um, communism came in 1944. They took everything away from us to the point of they actually had moved another family in our house. So all the land, everything he had worked for his entire life was taken away from us. Because what communism believed in is that they wanted to equalize everybody. So that's one of the things that, you know, personal freedom and desire to work and to succeed, that didn't work anymore. So, that story is the same for a lot of people. Um, after communism fell in 1989, they tried to return some of those material possessions back to us, but so many years later, 45 years later, especially he had, he had bought a lot of land, but what he had saved the most was 
money in the bank that was never returned to us. So I have a lot of stories of the persecution. I can share with just one of them that stuck with me throughout my entire life. And it's also a little bit of a story of integrity, and that's how I try to live my life every day, because I realize I have very big shoes to fill. Um, my grandfather had built a lot of, even buildings of national significance in Bulgaria, including monuments and bridges and other things. Um, my hometown is about an hour and a half north of the capital, Sofia. And to this day, we have a monument that's about 100 feet tall that stands on the mountain top over my hometown. Uh, he finished that monument through private donations in 1939, so that was five years before communism came. Uh, when communism came, first of all, the, the, the monument is in the shape of a cross. And the communists, they do not believe that you should believe in anything else but the party. So um, they obviously did not allow any religious freedom. And it's interesting that I mentioned this. We baptized my nephew two weeks ago here in Omaha. And uh, I realized that my parents told me that I was baptized at 2 o'clock in the morning one night in our living room. Uh, because they had to basically, the priest had to sneak in in our house to baptize me because that was not allowed. They were throwing cables with electricity in the churches and everything else you can imagine. So communism came in 1944 and they couldn't find an engineer to change that cross to the symbol of the party, which was the star. So they asked around and the only person who could change this was my grandfather. So after a couple of years of persecution and just pressure, taking away everything from us. Um, they finally came and knocked on the door and they said, if you don't do it, we'll put you in prison. And he went to prison for two years and finally he just had to give in. Um, to, while he was reconstructing that cross to the star, he was um, under house arrest uh, even if he had to go to the site, it had to be under military convoy and, and everything else you can imagine. Um, he finished the, the cross a few years, the star, a few years later. And uh, during the founding ceremony of the new monument, he didn't even want to go there. So he stayed behind, though, although he was the main person who created this. He just wanted to tell them that he didn't agree with that, but he had to choose between his life, and he held back for a number of years and between having to do that. Uh, communism in Bulgaria fell in 1989. Uh, my, my father had followed into my grandfather's footsteps, and he also had an engineering degree. Uh, two years later, he actually wanted to change the star back to a cross. And what was the most amazing thing is when they went to change it, is within the construction of the star, and again, this is, I'm no engineer by any means, they could find the cross within the star building. So if you can imagine, it was harder to construct that way and nobody knew about this, but my grandfather back in the 1940s knew or hoped that somebody's gonna change it back to the way it was. And thankfully, it was my own father. So this is the story that has just stayed with me and will stay with me until the day probably I, I die. Because it's, it's an amazing story of hope. And when people are pushed to the world, they do amazing things. And just the whole perseverance of the human spirit is amazing. Um, and we should all know that. So part of the story you're telling is about being rewarded for honest labor, I think, and, and that kind of going away a little bit. Um, Raphael had a similar story to tell. Um, you know, uh, when you were growing up, you felt like you were pretty well off. You would travel to the United States to go to Disney World in the summer and buy your clothes here and all that stuff. But then when you were a father yourself, you found yourself in a, in a socialist regime where you had to choose between buying your children shoes or milk. Um, and that's 
that's not a choice that any of us want to face, obviously. Um, but you mentioned that you really didn't want your children to grow up, grow up in this way and, and uh, experience a world in which their honest, honest work wouldn't result in, in good outcomes for them. Yes, yes, of course. And that's very sad with, uh, to see how your quality of living is deprived each day. Okay, and as you say, my, my parents were, were professors in the university, then I was a practically a spoiled child. Okay, I grew up coming to the United States to visit Mickey Mouse at least one week at the, uh, annually. And I ended up being professor of the university, deciding, I had to, to decide, to buy a pair of shoes to my children, or to buy the milk for my children. Because we're talking about a country when my last salary of, uh, as professor, senior professor, was $50 annual. $50 annual. If you buy the, 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 the dollars in the black market, that was the only way to, to buy, buy the dollars, and was the, the price of the dollar, the, the, that all people use to determine the prices of the, of the goods and services in Venezuela. And how people live there? It lives because they have family abroad. Uh, when I came to the United States, I had to help my, my parents. They were retired. Then many people here are professors in, in the university. You have uh, just imagine yourself depending on your children to send you money to buy your high, high blood pressure medicine because with your salary, with your retirement, you cannot afford your, your, your medicine. That was the life of the, the, the last years of my, of my mom and my, and, and my father. That, that is very, that's very hard. But I think that also, also in these kind of regimes, there is a, a point, a specific point, there. the, the crisis is so huge, it's so bad, it's so, 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 so big, that there is no room for morals and ethics. Then, you can have your children in a bubble, okay, in a crystal bubble, trying to, to give them the best education, give them moral ethics, but they are looking outside of that bubble. Then, they understand. I remember my, my son, one day, uh, he was in, in Lobo, and one day he was, you know, a kind of, uh, of, uh, of homesy, down because he, he wanted to, to, to see his, his grandparents. And I said, hey son, what, what happened to you? I miss a lot of my grandparents. Okay, let's do something. Let's return to Venezuela. I said to him, let's return to Venezuela. My son, when my son arrived to the United States, uh, he was five years old. And I'm talking around seven years old. It was two years after we arrived. And he responded to me, no, are you crazy? No. <laughs> we have to bring them because I want that they enjoy everything here. Then they really understood what was happening in Venezuela was just five years old. Okay? My, my daughter, I remember that was maybe, uh, uh, we loved a little bit at the end. We, we were very sad for that. The first time that we arrived, she was a um, 12 years. 11 years, 12 years, almost 12 years. And the first time that we went to uh, Walmart and we went to, to, to buy milk and power to my, to my son, to Abraham, uh, Laura, that's my, 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 my daughter, started, started to, to take a lot of milk and power cans. And you crazy, Laura, no, just one. No, no, you don't know if tomorrow we can find. Okay, yeah, because she was very, 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 you, you know, she know what was the, 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 the shortage of, uh, of goods and services. Then, in that moment, when, when, when you understand that you cannot, you cannot give a real education, and not because of you, it's the environment. The environment, they, uh, they started to understand it and to see that, that good people was not living okay. That for having things and stuff, you had to, to, to do not the right things. Then I, I started to say, well, no, I, I had to, I had to, to leave this. I had to find my way. The second, or maybe the first red flag for me was when I was a, a finishing a, one of, of my public lectures in Venezuela because I founded a think tank in Venezuela promoting free market 
and I was the director of politics of a grassroots uh, movement called Movimiento Libertad Venezuela, uh, maybe uh, Venezuela Freedom Movement, like that, with uh, political proposals, and we were promoting some, some reforms, and I, one of uh, that was the last uh, threaten that I, I was, damn, having a gun on, on, on your head with your wife and your, and, and your children in the back seat, seat of, the, of the car, but that make you think this is no way and this is not no my home country anymore. And I have to find any, any other place. And that was the, the, the moment when I say, no, the moral, the ethics, the security, and the future of my children are, and it's difficult, it's difficult, and maybe more in my age because I was in my 40s, I was professor in my, 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 my house, I have a job, at least I had a job, then that, that is very, very difficult, but I think that who made me possible to, to, to move and to take the decision of my children, really. So it's, it's difficult to survive. Um, it's not a place you want to be, and yet I think, uh, at least in the experiences that I've heard you guys relate, it's difficult to leave sometimes. So Oleg, you mentioned that it took your parents 12 years to be allowed to leave the USSR. Do you want to tell us a little bit more? So I have a question for a random member of this audience. For example, who owns you? Do you have an owner? No? no? That's heresy, <laughs> by the standards of a socialist society. If you live in a society where the state is the monopolist on labor and everything else, they're also monopolist on the way of thinking about life because essentially they're a jealous cult that stands no other competition, they treat you as property. In the United States, you can move from one state to another without seeking permission. That is not possible in a socialist country. They don't just want to register you at the new place, they insist that they give or withhold permission. The entire system is built on trade of influence, and the higher up you are, the more you have sway over everybody else in every minutia. Uh, when my parents wanted to leave, they were not allowed to and were persecuted for wanting to leave. They were able to get our names out to interested parties in other countries, but the very act of talking to Americans was an unofficial criminal offense. So my father took serious risks with that. In the end, uh, we, among with a few other families, were essentially traded for subsidized grain credits by the US. I hope US got a good deal out of it. Uh, but. Uh, uh, one of the reasons why even living in the South to have minimal sympathy with the uh, uh, great cause of the late and unpleasantness is that having lived in a country where we were property, I don't particularly empathize with folks who wanted to enslave others uh, if it was overt or covert. Uh, and there, uh, just like in certain Greek city-states, uh, people were essentially property, uh, polite term for slaves. Uh, and if you look at difference between, let's say, North Korea and South Korea, a South Korean crazy enough to want to move to the North can do so. Uh, might not be able to leave again, but can at least go to the North. North Korean can go, not go to the South. And in the end, you wind up with an incredibly inbred culture where there's one way to do business, there's one way to do culture, there's one to do, way to do anything, and as a result, socialist societies do not necessarily stand up well to challenges of changing conditions. Unfortunately, when they fail, they tend to bury much of their population underneath, as had happened in uh, Venezuela, for example. Um, Deanna, you had a similar story to relate about your parents traveling to um, Austria with a group. Um, just that I think that illustrates really nicely how difficult it is to to really have free movement in a socialist society. Yeah, I I always wonder why they closed the borders if they they said that the West was so bad. Um, my parents. Uh, decided, so they got married in 1981, and three years later, they wanted to go on a honeymoon to a Western country, um, Vienna, Austria. So 
they had to go through numerous interviews with the state to be allowed to leave the country to go there for four days. Um, they were with a group of people, so they were not them, just by themselves. Uh, my mother tells me that there were a couple of buses of people who were investigated, interviewed. Um, they just wanted to make sure that you would come back. So they left by bus and they, they had to come back by ship on the Danube River um, all the way to Bulgaria. Um, when they, they uh, got on the ship, half of the group had left. So they, the only reason why they went back is because I was three years old and I was waiting for them and they knew that they couldn't leave me behind. But it is amazing the lack of just indoctrination. Um, my mother and I were even talking about it yesterday. They, they were warned, they were told you're going to an enemy state if you see anything there, you don't discuss it here. So basically the Communist Party did not want people to know in Bulgaria how the Western world used to live. And to make matters worse, you're only allowed in the equivalent of about 20 to 30 US dollars to take with you because you are not allowed to bring in a lot of goods um, in, in Bulgaria. So it's my, my father had to hide some additional 20 or 30 dollars in the handle of his umbrella so they can buy a little bit more. And just one more story that's just a very brief caveat here because I remember when communism fell in 1989 in Bulgaria um, and there was, by my school, there was what we call the uh, Russian bookstore. And they had changed it. They changed it after the fall of communism to a chandelier place where they sold all lamps and other things. I remember when they, they opened that place up, I stood there probably for hours looking at that stuff because back then I had seen things that are only a little bit black and white. So all the colors and all the... Um, I cannot imagine what a person from North Korea, for example, if they came to the United States, how they would react. Through the eyes of a six or seven year old, I still remember that store to this day. And I remember when they started bringing goods in a little bit, so it's not a sudden thing. Um, bananas and oranges, we didn't have that. So you would go to school and somebody would tell you, one of your classmates would tell you, I had a banana last night. And you would be so amazed, you, say, you had a banana, that's amazing. Where did you get it from? Somebody traveled and they were opening the borders and brought bananas. Uh, uh, to this day, I remember one of my classmates who had brought in a candy like tweezers and it looked like a little rope or something and we all gathered the whole class and we said, that's not a candy. He said, no, it is a candy. So he had to cut a little piece to everybody so we can believe them because there was only one type of candy in Bulgaria as I was growing up. So the type of those things, I hope that those stories stay with you because they're not what you would read on the news or you would be told on the news. Those are real stories that I have lived in post-communism times and I will tell you that <coughs> Things like microwaves, I probably saw one when I was 14, 15 years old and I'm not that old. Uh, computers, before I left in Bul Bulgaria in 2001, we didn't have a computer in the house. Air conditioning, we got there probably 15 years ago. It is, it is amazing some of the things that here in America we take for granted. To that, I would like to add, one of the Russian proverbs that is self-referential is, we may be poor, but we're honest. And the reality is there's no honesty in socialism at all. Because it is such a jealous cult, if you have a child that you, whom you would like to educate about reality, you have to be super careful about this. What if the child speaks accidentally in school and betrays the knowledge of something other than official propaganda? then the child might be without parents as they go to some distant Siberian places. So education was very much crippled. Double think in the Orwellian sense was uh, order of the day. 
and everything was secret, and especially that there were two tiers of society. There were the drones and the kings, so to speak. Anybody who was connected to the party was vying for special distribution of goods, special distribution of services, special favors. And there were two laws, uh, two sets of laws for everybody and then for the special people. Uh, and with all of that, because socialism is so horribly inefficient, people who were even relatively high in the party hierarchy had at best middle class existence by US standards, but they wanted to be the kings over a uh, poor village instead of being uh, uh, partners in a rich village somewhere in the US instead. So when you look at constraints and economic activity, they are always coincident with constraints on cultural activity, and they're always, uh, uh, they always go hand in hand with constraints on conscience. You can't act your conscience in a place like that, you simply won't survive. So, Bob, um, maybe bringing it back to your travel log, um, ethnographic research of the bar culture in socialist countries. <laughs> Um, is there a, an example or an experience that stood out to you and Ben when you were traveling? Yeah, there, there's a lot, but you have to buy the book to, to um, hear them all. <laughs> Amazon.com. Uh, yeah, I mean, without question, both Ben and I uh, had the same answer for uh, people ask us what's the most like memorable or poignant moment in the book. And it was uh, related to Venezuela. We went to Cucuta, Colombia, which is on the border of Venezuela. Uh, in Colombia, and um, which is a fairly large city, but uh, on the Colombian side, and there's two bridges you can cross on foot because the Venezuelans have prohibited vehicles from crossing because everybody with a car would leave and never come back. But so people can cross on foot and go to Colombia to buy food, and you get to the you get to these bridges, and there are these uh, huge makeshift uh, bazaar of of, of uh, little tiendas, little stalls of rice and beans and sugar and uh, diapers and aspirin and deodorant and shampoo, pretty much everything you could buy. And the most memorable moment was we, we, we uh, my Spanish is pretty much limited to una cerveza, por favor. But we had a, a friend with us who could help us uh, and we stopped a, a young couple, Ana, Ana Maria and Paolo, and they had tr driven uh, three days from Ciudad Bolivar, and as Rafael knows, Ciudad Bolivar is really on the other side of Venezuela. So they had come from far eastern Venezuela to the western border with Colombia, and they said it took them three days, one way, to get here. And uh, Paulo worked in a hotel. They were middle class people. They weren't rich professors. They were just normal people. And um, but they weren't peasants either. They were, you know, sort of working people. And, uh, they, and we asked them, what are they doing? Well, they're gonna fill their car up with, with I'm like, oh, you're going to Disneyland, you're gonna shop. No, they're, they're, they're gonna buy rice and beans and sugar. And it really hit me. Um, and Anna mentioned that she had, they had a, a child. I don't know how old, but she had a, they had a child they had left behind with family. And it, that really, you know, just punched me in the face because how, how bad would your life have to be for you to get into a car and drive from Omaha to Vancouver, um, and for, for to go to Kroger or Albertsons or whatever you have here in Omaha, a grocery store run. It's a six-day round trip through dangerous country, and they had mentioned that this was probably the last time they would be able to do it because it had gotten too dangerous to travel in, in Venezuela, and it made it very personal because these people were like me. I grew up working class, but I mean these are these are not this, these weren't normal, like they, they weren't peasants, they weren't rich, they, it was just regular people. And uh, that's the dystopia that they now were living in. And I, I think about Anna and Paolo frequently now, I will see them again, I have no idea where they are, but it's both of us after that conversation, we had to actually stop and go get a beer. We, it was like, we need a break, we can't, we can't take um, more of these emotional stories. There's a lot more like that, but that was the one that sticks out the most. Maybe as a last question, just before we open it up for the audience um, to ask some questions. Well, like you mentioned that in the beginning, um, that you're very glad you're here because you get to do all the things you love. 
Can you just tell us a little bit more about the sorts of restrictions that are imposed on people living in socialist and communist countries in terms of their ability to choose their professional identities? So as a photographer, graphic designer, creative director, I work with people from all over the world. Contacts with foreigners were either prohibited or restricted or just made impossible by technical means. That's one of the problems. The other problem is that because the state gives you the education, and they give the education in two ways. One, being a monopolist employer, they pay five to 10 cents on the dollar, essentially, uh, to people who are already working for them. And two, let's say you become a doctor, you are forced to do a particular kind of work uh, for the next so many years. The state sometimes tells you what your employment is going to be. Uh, and it's very difficult to change. You certainly were not permitted to start your own business that was not under the uh, uh, umbrella of the state. Uh, and then there were certain uh, fields in which uh, uh, it was very restricted in terms of uh, uh, what people could do, for example, uh, even if you wanted to produce a prototype of aircraft or weapon or something to do with high tech, uh, you could not legally do that. So my other side, because I feel that uh, uh, armed population is the insurance against uh, socialist takeover by force, I have been promoting Second Amendment and uh, ownership of arms pretty much since I came to the United States. Uh, over the last few years, I've gotten into designing firearms and uh, working with uh, uh, people all over the country for that. Um, something that was distinctly not possible because anything that gives you a defense against your quote unquote social betters, owners essentially, is not permitted. Slaves are not permitted defenses. In the United States, although we have quite a few restrictions, we're still better off because there is a cultural assumption that you are an independent human and can defend yourself legally. Uh, in most of the rest of the world, including Russia, uh, that was not the case. There is no such thing as legal self-defense, and there were prison terms for quote-unquote exceeding necessary limits of self-defense, which was uh, pretty much anything you could do that was effective. So uh, if you were to personify socialist state, that would be the abusive boyfriend that tells you that you may not work except for him. You may not leave the house without permission. You may not have any defensive arms. You may not hold most types of property, etc., etc., etc. And if that was a human telling you that, you would consider that human to be somewhere between crazy and criminal. Uh, if you're brought up in that environment and anybody tell, trying to counter that is beaten down, you kind of grow up to observe it. And that's what we all hope to prevent. We hope to prevent the kind of brainwashing that makes next Venezuela possible. All right, with that, I think we're gonna open it up for questions from the audience. If anybody has a question, I can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you this, I first wanna say thank you for all of your inspiring stories. I mean, we have it so good here in America. Um, this is actually a question for Dr. Lawson. I wanted to know how, with regards to your economic freedom index, how you respond to um, the human development index by Martin Sen, who um, argues that certain positive rights are justified on the grounds that they are effective targeted relief programs. Yeah, there's, uh, there's, there's some uh, confusion or disagreement, I guess, is about the word freedom. And we use freedom in what philosophers call the negative sense, the absence of inner, absence of coercion or the absence of interference. Uh, Marcia Sen, Nobel Prize winner, uh, way more famous than I'll ever be, uh, likes to talk about development as freedom. And I, I just, I, I have no actual particular problem with Sen. I mean, um, Sen would like to see the world live people in this world live a more comfortable material existence, and so would I. Um, he wants to define a comfortable material existence as freedom, and I think that's not exactly correct. 
Um, and so it's more, maybe it's a semantic or you know a jargon disagreement more than anything else. Um, you know, but even taking Sen on his own terms, uh, you know, countries that are more economically free, in my sense of the word freedom, do better on every development measure that Sen would put up. And so I, I don't think we have we, we have a, a jargon difference. Maybe we have a little bit of a different point of view in terms of how we use language. But the fact of the matter is, empirically, uh, Sen should be as free market as I am because the data are really quite clear. Uh, that, that economic freedom or capitalism or whatever the word is um, delivers those development goals that Sen cares about, um, that I care about. He wants to also call that freedom. I think it's a little circular, but fine. That's, you know, we have, can I, if I ever see, we'll have that debate. But, um, you know, so the index is, uh, demonstrates, I think, clearly the empirical linkage between uh, economic freedom, capitalism, and, and uh, you know, a comfortable material existence for most people. You're also familiar with the concept of economic crowding out. Uh, government programs tend to crowd out private charity and voluntary assistance. The United States is incredibly charitable country. The more uh, economic or other assistance is forced, the more it saps the funds that would otherwise be privately allocated, and the more it saps the spirit of it. Uh, so the end result actually becomes inferior with more of the resources being wasted through inefficiency or through graft in the process. Another question over here. Thanks. Uh, some of you guys mentioned that you're a little fearful of things that you've seen in the media that are maybe pushing America towards more socialistic country. Maybe what are some better examples of things that you've seen that maybe relate to the countries that you came from? I think somebody here mentioned that um, they posted this event on Facebook and it was taken down. Why was that? I think it was because of Bob's book. When <laughs> <laughs> we took his title there out There are of so that. many others like that. That's a perfect example of what happens. It doesn't come overnight. It comes very slowly. And if we don't see it, we won't recognize it. So. I want you to be aware of that, that it's, it's just an inch by inch, those freedoms, the same in Bulgaria didn't come overnight, but those freedoms were eventually taken away fully. And we have to be aware of that. Raphael mentioned something in, in this context. Um, you said that you guys would at, try to advertise things in Venezuela on Facebook and anytime you had a criticism of socialism that was taken down. Same thing happened here. Yes, yes, actually, you can you can use any bad word before capitalism, okay? And they did not turn down the, your, your your prom, but if you use a, an adjective uh, against socialism, they immediately take out your, your your advertisement, okay? And that happens also also in, in Venezuela with my with my think tank when we would try to to prom something in Facebook. And the other thing I'll note is that socialism is often imposed by force of arms, either through domestic insurrection or through foreign intervention, but then uh, the state very jealously guards its monopoly on force. So I'll ask you, if I invite you over to dinner, and I just mention as an aside, oh, and by the way, please come unarmed, wouldn't you kind of wonder what I have in mind and why I would like you to do that? Uh, the gun control may or may not be your cause, but it is a very convenient canary in the mind, so to speak, because it's an early indicator of an attempt to impose something that uh, you wouldn't be happy about. And your freedom or your resources are one of those. And socialism eats its children, so to speak, twice. First time it takes what the resources were, generated prior to the imposition, and the second time as it enslaves the population and uh, reduces them to uh, little uh, parts, little cogs in the state. All right.
we uh, are out of time. Thank you all so much for joining us um, this afternoon. If you have any other questions, feel free to come up and, and ask them. Um, and please look up the Institute for Economic Inquiry um, website and sign up for our newsletter if you're interested in coming to other events. Thank you so much. Thank you for the